Hello lovely people, this week I'm back with another book chat video. Book chat is a regularly but not scheduled recap of what I've been reading recently. This week I've got two non-fiction and three fiction books to talk about. I'm gonna alternate and go fiction, non-fiction, fiction, non-fiction, non just to keep you on your toes. So, we are going to start off with a book that I super loved and that I knew I was going to super love, and that is Dead Man's Chest by Kerry Greenwood, a Franny Fisher novel. Um, Franny Fisher is a lady detective who is in 1920s Melbourne, Australia. Um, the books are the source for a TV show which is also on Netflix which is delightful and stars Essie Fox as the eponymous hero and it's just utterly fabulous and I love everything about it, specifically the costumes, they're amazing. Um, so I started off watching the TV show and have started reading the books as a result. This is like something like number 18 in the series but it's the second book I've read because it's a book which one of the episodes of the TV series is based off of so I assumed that I would be okay to watch it without 17, 16 prior books knowledge, and it, and it was, it was great. Um, when you read something that is um, the source for something you've already watched, there's always that thing of, is it going to be really repetitive because you know what happens, or is it just going to be delightful to get that extra layer and that extra level of depth? And this fell into the second category because it was just fabulous. I don't remember, there's some characters in this which I don't think were in the episode and so there was a, a degree of freshness to it because there was still new stuff rather than it just being like a rehashing of the old which I think Cocaine Blues was much more similar so if anything I probably enjoyed this one slightly more than Cocaine Blues it's about Phryne and her household go on holiday to the seaside which is supposed to be a holiday away from crime and murder and drama but of course that is not the case the people who are supposed to be um, looking after them in the house have gone missing and Phryne will discover who did it, accompanied by tales of mysterious plat cutters running through town and surrealist people living next door and a variety of other things, lost treasure, all of this stuff. Um, suffice to say, a delightful romp as per usual and has not in any way dulled my love for the Miss Fisher series. Second up, we have Violet to Vita, The Letters of Violet Refuses to Vita Saxel West, edited by Mitchell A. Liska and John Phillips. This I have talked about in a haul before, a bit of a while ago, I finally got around to reading it. Really enjoyed it. Um, for background knowledge, um, Violet and Vita were two very well-off women back in the 20s who had a wildly intense love affair. The main part of it spanned like, I think about three years or so, a number of years. Um, they were both married to men um, and they caused quite some scandals because they um, would run off together from time to time. Um, obviously in the 1920s society, being in a female same-sex relationship, not super acceptable. Um, and this is a compilation of the letters from Violet to Vita. Vita's responses to Violet were all destroyed by Violet's husband in a jealous rage at some point. They only have the one side of the story, um, but it was very interesting to read. Um, Violet is quite an intense person. I think they were probably both quite intense people, let's be fair. Um, but these letters have some incredibly beautiful expressions of love in it. I've, um, I've highlighted a couple. Well, you ask me point blank why I love you. I love you, Vita, because I fought so hard to win you. I love you, Vita, because you never gave me back my ring. I love you because you have never yielded in anything. I love you because you never capitulate. I love you for your wonderful intelligence, for your literary aspirations, for your unconscious, question mark, coquetry. I love you because you have the air of doubting nothing. I love in you what is also in me, imagination, the gift for languages, taste, intuition, and a host of other things. I love you, Vita, because I've seen your soul. I have these gorgeous moments like that, which are so beautiful. Um, but obviously, as time goes by, the relationship between them changes. What essentially happened is Violet and Vita knew each other since they were about teenagers, about 15. 
Um, but Vita was engaged in a relationship with another woman for a while, um, and then they eventually formed a relationship, the two of them, um, which sort of the peak, the emotional peak of it, was they ran away together, um, they lived, um, I think mostly in France, but like on the continent, if you will, and um, they were together the, for a number of months away, um, until they ran out of money and all that sort of thing, and then eventually Vita did return to her husband, because um, there seems to be this, this struggle where Vita was married to a man who was gay, um, but they had children together, and in many ways there was love there. It might not have been um, the type of love that she felt for Violet, but there was love there, and there was almost, as the introduction of this sort of talks about how there's like this conflict between Vita, which Violet doesn't quite understand, whereby she can be, she's very masculine, if you will, a very like masculine dominant figure in her relationship with Violet, but there is a validity in the way she is with her husband Howard and her children and the family aspect of that as well, which is something that um, Violet never really seems to understand. So from Violet's side, there are, after they come back from this um, running away together thing, and then there's moments where, there's periods where Vita distances herself from Violet and that sort of thing. And Violet can be quite intentionally manipulative. She's threatening to kill herself. She's threatening X, Y, and Z. She's saying that she, like Vita can't understand how miserable she is and all of this stuff, which is entirely fair as an experience. But personally, like if I had been on the receiving end of those letters, that would have been difficult. So the affair between them did kind of end, whereby they stopped planning to run away together and Vita stopped responding to Violet's letters, so Violet eventually stopped writing. But it seems like the love that was between them never really went away, and it was still present throughout both of their lives. Um, and if I'm, if I'm sounding mildly incoherent, it's because the raw reality of the complexity of love affairs and specifically same-sex love affairs in a time when you're not really openly allowed to be doing such things is so intense and so complicated that just talking about it in like an easy way is quite difficult because they're this gets these letters get desperate at times and at other times they're loving and lovely and at other times they're they're hating and there's such a torrid of emotion happening in this. It was, I really enjoyed reading this. Um, I don't necessarily know if enjoyed is the right term because you do get these times when Violet feels abandoned and blah 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 blah. But um, suffice to say, uh, this was a really good, I'm really glad I read this and the insight into this relationship was very interesting because um, part of my drive of reading more LGBTQ plus books is also to be reading more own voices, which um, I'm interpreting as a lot of non-fiction, so people's real lived experiences and stuff like that, um, which has mostly been a lot of contemporary autobiographies. So to read something a little bit more historical and that was not necessarily written as like a here I am expressing myself to an audience, but like here I am revealing my soul to you, was just um, a very interesting experience. After that we have a complete change with Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams. Um, I watched the first episode of this on Netflix, haven't watched any more, although I did really enjoy it because I bought the book and I was like, oh I'll read the book then I'll finish watching the TV show. So there was a strange early part of this book where I was reading it and I was like, oh I wonder when the stuff that I watched in the TV show is going to happen. Spoiler alert, this is very different. It doesn't really happen, um, which is totally fine, but there was an adjustment period when I was like, okay, this is different. Um, I really enjoyed this. I thought, I read Douglas Adams as a kid, because my family's very into like sci-fi and stuff like this, so I read, I couldn't tell you how many of the Hitchhiker's Guide books, but I read a number of them as a child, and I don't really remember it very well. So they're on my to-read list when I get a chance, but I don't own them, my family does. Whereas I do own this, and so I thought I will start here. I um, do love me a good mystery, as you can tell from the Franny Fisher. So to have like a sort of science fictiony mystery, that's like my cup of tea. I'm super into that. Um, and after I got over my brain leap that I had to make, whereby I was like, okay, this is not going to go the way I'm expecting it, 
I just had a thoroughly wonderful time seeing where this was going to take me and all of the different how all the different players would connect to each other and all stuff like that um I gather it's part of a series I have seen on Goodreads that people say that this is really good but the rest of the series is not good that's a question because if you have read the series as a whole do give me your opinions. Should I be finding the second book and reading it, or should I be leaving it as a one-shot? I don't know. I'm intrigued, but I don't know where we would go after this. I don't know. Give me your thoughts, please. So, book four is another non-fiction, and that is American Interior by Griff Reese, or to give it its full name, American Interior, The Quixotic Journey of John Evans, His Search for a Lost Tribe, and How, Fueled by Fantasy and Possibly Booze, he accidentally annexed a third of North America. Um, this was another, this was lent to me. Um, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed all of these. This was this is a very effusive book chat. Um, suffice to say, Griff Reese is the lead singer of Super Furry Animals, um, which is not a band I particularly know very well. <laughs> to set up this book, there was this theory which became very popular, um, fueled a lot by Yolo Morganic and a lot of his tales. Um, that this legendary Welsh prince, Madog, travelled over, over to America and that in America there was a tribe of Native Americans who were actually Welsh, who spoke Welsh. So John Evans decided to set off to America. This is during like the late 1700s, early, like 1792, that's the date that's in my mind, could be slightly later, don't know. Um, so late 1700s set off over to America to see if he could discover this tribe. Griff Reese is a blood ancestor of John Evans, so Griff Reese decides that he is going to do a music tour of America, playing little gigs in places, to trace John Evans' journey and to see if he can find out what happened to him. To help him on his journey, he enlists the felt mistress who creates like a felt puppet avatar of John Evans, which he takes with him on this journey, and simultaneously he's also writing songs about John Evans and the journey, which become the album American Interior, which I have listened to, and a film, which I haven't seen, and the book tells you all of that. Does it sound like a lot? It kind of is, but it's told in such an amusing and light and engaging way that this was actually a super duper easy read. The book is kind of split into sections, um, and so you get sort of like a, like in a play, you get a list of characters at the start, which give you a little line of context about who they are, both in the 1700s and in his modern journey. And then um, he traces the journey, which the map tells me goes from Baltimore, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, New Madrid, Cape Garado, St. Louis, Louis, sorry, French, and then up to the Mandan Nation. Here is a map. So, um, in the 1700s, that's a pretty big journey to me. So this book as a whole was really interesting, and reading about John Evans' journey was super interesting. I've never really read a non-fiction book that tells a similar story before. So that was all really interesting, but my favourite bit, which I wanted to talk about briefly, is um, my favourite parts of this book were towards the latter half, where um, Griff Reese, while tracing um, John's journey, talks to a lot of um, First Nation tribes, because um, John Evans would have made it up to the Mandan Nation, which is, um, I think, just like in what is now Canada. Um, I really hope I've understood the geography of this book correctly, because my geography skills are poor. Um, but as part of his journey, Griff talks to um, one of the, well, he talks to, I just, I can't remember names very well, he talks to Edwin Benson, who is the only living first language speaker of the Mandan language currently. Um, he also talks to Keith Bear, who is a uh, present-day Mandan flute player and storyteller, and he talks to Corey Spotted Bear, who is actively trying to learn the Mandan language to keep it alive. Um, they have a lot of discussions, which I've really enjoyed, about about language, about keeping language alive, that sort of thing, which has a great parallel to Griff Reese, who is Welsh, and although it's on a much different scale, don't get me wrong, but, you know, um, the Welsh language is something which, I mean, I am not a Welsh speaker, I am attempting to pick up some Welsh, because my boyfriend is a Welsh speaker, but um, I, it's very important to keep languages of places alive, and for someone who's based in the UK, 
my nearest point of comparison is Welsh and is the drive to keep the Welsh language alive. But then you see it on such a different scale with Edwin being the last person alive who is the first language speaker of this language and, you know, the importance of keeping that alive and of um, keeping those cultures alive and the traditions and all of these things which were lost partly in, you know, due in large part to the colonization of America and then, you know, the etc. Like, there's a whole complicated history there as to why these languages are at risk and stuff like that, which I do not, I will not go into because I'm not an expert on this topic. However, those discussions between them about language was very interesting, as were their discussion, just their whole discussions in general. There's a whole bit, um, if you'll put up with me just flicking through quickly, where he is quotes directly from Edwin Bowers. Um, and it's all um, formatted like this because of the way in which it's spoken. And just this, this whole direct quotation was just, I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, not to spoil history for you, but it's very, there is not a Native American tribe that is Welsh. It's very likely that there were some misunderstandings, blah blah blah, it's all explained in the book. Um, and John Evans died and we don't actually, they don't know where he was buried. And so part of Griff's journey by the end of it is just finding some way to just honour your ancestor and you just keep, that sort of, this whole, this whole thing. Um, I feel like I'm rambling, which is always a sign that something's been good, but I feel like it's maybe I've lost my track. Suffice to say, a very interesting, like, travel memoir type book that is also about the history of one man who just ended up just, his life was just very interesting actually. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in any of those topics that I have rambled about, would highly recommend. Very easy read, very quick read, um, but super enjoyable. And finally, back to some fiction, we've got Riverkeep by Martin Stewart. This was another one of my um, ten books I wanted to read this year. I've been a bit shoddy, so there's probably going to be some coming up in this run of book chats because I'm actually trying to finish that. Um, this is one of the books that I got free from Penguin Platform. I think this is the last book I finally finished it. I've just eked them out over time. This was sold to me as a, a cross between something that I can't remember and Philip Pullman. And I will say now, this is not Philip Pullman-esque. That description was a bad marketing move because when I first went into this I had an adjustment period where I was like, oh, this is not Philip Paul, this is not how I expected it to be because I was making a comparison with his dark materials. That's not to say I didn't like this, it was enjoyable. I had a small adjustment period. Um, this tells the story, it was darker than I expected, if anything, by which I mean because I know his dark materials does deal with some topics. Um, this tells the story of Wool, William who is Riverkeep with his father. So in this world, like, they are the keepers of this river. They, um, fish out the dead bodies and, like, sort of, um, take them to be identified and, like, pay respects to them and honour them so that in, even though these people have died, they have some dignity in death and they're not just left to rot and stuff like this. Um, one day, while out on the water, something, like, his dad gets taken under by something and when he comes back up, it is not his dad. His dad has been, like, possessed. Um, so, Wool hears the story of this m big mythical creature who suddenly, like, appeared in, like, this town, and he reads that, th that there's something about this creature that could cure possession. So he goes on this journey. Along the way, he picks up a cast of other characters, and this, like, motley crew, they have adventures, etc, etc, etc. Um, by about midway through, I was really enjoying this actually. I got quite pulled in, even though it was nothing like I expected. When I say it was a bit darker than I expected, like we've already got like his job is to pull dead people out of the water. And then um, there was just like some dis some descriptions of the ways in which people were um, attacked and killed um, by characters in this, which might be, if you're like, ooh, should I give this to my young child? Maybe not, like a late teen, like late teen, early to late teen Sophie would have, this would have been like one of the books she really liked. 
there were lots of ideas in this. This was very episodic. Like, we are going along the river in a boat and we meet X person and we have Y exchange and then we pick up a character. And then we move along again and we meet X person and we have Y exchange and we pick up a character. And we do that for a bit. And then we are, like, going along as a, as a group and we encounter this person and we deal with this as a topic. Um, that kind of a thing. So, um... And you sort of become aware part way through that one of these threads that is like the driving force behind someone is not going to end the way they want it to. That being said, I still found this really enjoyable. I still found myself wanting to read it to find out what happened. It's not my favourite like um, YA fantasy book, but it was thoroughly enjoyable. My critique would be, um, I found by the end of this we've got an interesting cast of characters and I felt like only our main character's plotline was really wrapped up. So um, unless this is the start of a series, which I am unaware if that is the case, um, I would have liked some more depth to what happens to the other characters, because it definitely left open, like, if he wanted to pick it up and write about what these other characters are off doing, he could. However, as I would like this to read as a as a book. I would like this to read as a book. No. I just mean I would like to either have it obviously be the start of a series or to have all of my threads wrapped up because there are a lot of stuff in this which we are not really given answers to. There are characters whose stories are left open but we don't know what they're doing. I just know what our main guy is doing. And that's that. So that is the end of this week's book chat. It's been a largely positive bag this week. I feel like this has been a, a good reading run for me personally. If you have read any of these and have thoughts on them, I would love to hear them. If you have any recommendations from things that you've been reading recently, I would also love to hear them. As per usual, just feel welcome to chat about books with me. I will go now, and I will see you next week for something different. <laughs>